Okay. Hey, hello, friends. It's your Chapo. It's we're back again. It's me, Matt, and Felix coming to you on this Monday afternoon. Um, how's it going, fellas? How was your weekend? Uh, you know, uh, did what I usually do, but uh, now that you know movies are out again, you know I, I've done what everyone does during quarantine. We all we've all done it. It's all part of the new normal. Uh, you know, I could go into the whole thing about how, uh, you know, the world's crazy now. The best golfer is a woman. The best rapper is a woman. The three most powerful guys are uh, Bush, Colin, and Biden. All that. But, you know, we know it. But, you know, one of those rituals that we've all done, I get uh, Annie's uh, canned biscuits. And I sit on them till they're warm. <laughs> and then I stick my finger in them to simulate finger blasting while I watch a movie. Except now that the theaters are back, I went to enjoy In the Heights while doing that. But I, I couldn't concentrate on the simulated finger blasting, which I'm not, do, I'm not doing because it like gets me horny. I'm doing it because, like, for practice. Technique. Uh, yeah, if I ever do that again. Um, I couldn't concentrate on that because it's too busy clapping along to all the Washington-style, Washington Heights-style hits in that film. Washington Heights! I have no financial relationship with In the Heights or Lynn Manuel Miranda. I just enjoyed doing this. Was your movie going experience um, interrupted at any point when any of the local youths found out that you were fingering dough and decided to yell it at the entire theater? They called me a very bad word I can't repeat. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get in, let's get into the let's get into the news this week. Uh, first up, I'd like to talk about data. <laughs> That's right, data, and a group of plucky upstarts that are using this thing called data for progress to push the Democrats to the left by giving them the data that they need to enact popular policies that we all love and adore that, you know, heretofore they weren't supporting because they just didn't have data to support it. But, but luckily, there's data now. Would you guys like some data? I, I can't get enough data, personally. To me, like, data is sort of the uh, lifeblood of information, Absolutely. Data is the powerhouse of the cell, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> data, was, data was the star of Star Trek. He's my favorite character on Next Generation. Yeah, it's, it's the true. best one. Yeah. Okay, this it comes courtesy of the uh, New York Times. This is uh, just out over the weekend. This is a profile of Data for Progress by uh, Lisa Lerner. Or we start Lisa Lehrer. Um, it says, born on the left, data for progress comes of age in Biden's Washington. A liberal think tank has grown comfortable with mainstream influence. Other activists say that being normie means it's selling out. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but uh, normies, I say kill them all. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Had enough of them. Yeah, no, there should be there should be tests and uh you know, you should line up every military aged man in a village and show them XKCD strips and if they can't explain why it's funny you behead them. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the on politics uh, wrap-up of national politics, and it begins as such. President Biden mentions it in private calls. The White House reads its work, and Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, teams up with its leaders for news conferences, blog posts, and legislation. The embrace of data for progress by the highest ranks of the Democratic Party is a coming-of-age moment for a left-leaning polling firm and think tank that is barely three years old. This week, legislation that was championed by the group and that would pour nearly a quarter trillion dollars into scientific research and development passed the Senate. Earlier this year, Julian Brave Noise Cat, vice president of policy and strategy, led a successful campaign to nominate and confirm Deb Haaland, the first Native American cabinet secretary. Part of the group's early success reflects the Democratic Party that shifted to the left during the Trump era, but it also signifies the maturing of a new generation of liberal activists who are grappling with how to wield power when they're no longer in the opposition. For Data for Progress, the strategy is Politics 101. Politicians like policies that are popular. Hmm. So the, uh, yeah, the like, po policies that are popular, like a quarter trillion dollar investment into scientific research. We love science in this country. We fucking love it, in fact. I mean, the good thing about like uh, putting money into R&D is that we see the returns in pharmaceutical prices and access in this country. That's... That is the good part about it, is that all of that public funding, it, it comes back to the consumer in the form of lower prices, and we love to see it. 
The secret sauce here is that we've developed a currency they're interested in, says Sean McElwee, the executive director of the group. We get access. It's called Sean Coin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get access to a lot of offices because everyone wants to learn about the numbers. Once again, that currency, it's numbers, folks. And they got them. They got the ones. They got the numbers. They got the twos. They have most of the numbers that exist. And Democratic offices, they want access to them. Um, and, you know, the numbers will say what is popular. The big secret, polling data that's targeted, cheap, and fairly accurate. I like the thing with the <laughs> caveat, fairly yeah, accurate. It's, it's pretty good. It's fairly accurate. This is a big secret here. The secret sauce is polling data. Aides to Democratic congressional leaders say data for progress can quickly poll on policies like expanding the child care tax credit or unemployment benefits or spending $400 billion on senior care that would be considered too specific for a full survey by some other polling firms. And by finding ways to do operations that pollsters traditionally outsource, the organization can charge tens of thousands of dollars less than more established firms, according to Mr. McElwee. Data for progress then uses those quick turnaround surveys to push its version of a progressive agenda boosting liberal candidates in primaries and persuading Democrats to rally around popular liberal policies once in office. Okay, it's that last part, persuading Democrats to rally around popular liberal policies once in office. I guess I'm, I'm waiting to see the returns on that because, like, uh, I mean, like, a, a large amount of polling data would seem to suggest that the, pop, the most single most popular broad, broadly across all categories in America, the single most popular policy is Medicare for all. And I don't see any Democratic politicians or anyone buying data for progress polls to be rallying around that cause so much. Well, you're forgetting that the real secret sauce of uh, the polling that they do is that they will give you the results you want. That's really it, is that whatever you want to have in your hand to justify yourself to donors or the press or or anybody else, you can get from them. And that's what they provide for you. It's, it's like a, it's, 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 it's custom polling. It's bespoke polling for, for uh, po pol politicians to uh, validate their, the policies that they already want to carry out. Well, for instance, yeah. Rep Representative uh, Wasserman Schultz, 61% uh, of likely voters say that your hair looks normal. You don't have to do anything to it. So what you've been doing for the past 30 years is fine. It looks good. You know, uh, Representative Gillum. Keep doing everything you've been doing. <laughs> Everyone loves it. Representative Nadler, no one can smell anything when you come into a room. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like uh, to that end, uh, Data for Progress just released a poll this week that was written up in Vox, which finds, uh, surprisingly, that um, Joe Biden's uh, policies and stances vis-a-vis -vis Israel Palestine is totally in keeping with the Democratic Party mainstream of their of voters. So, oh, that's uh, oh, okay, cool. All right, no, no need to think about that ever so, again. So yeah, no I mean, need to do anything, think about anything. I know it may evaluate anything. It may seem like there's, you know, like like certain elements of the Democratic base, or like there, are, there is a you know sort of an opinion shift moving on on Israel away from America being in lockstep with this country for in every single thing it does. But the new data for progress poll is that you know the mainstream of Democratic voters uh, are totally in line with Joe Biden, and uh, they they achieve this result by uh, describing Joe Biden as a neutral arbiter between two parties and, and the Palestinians as the instigators of the conflict. So on those terms, uh, the, President Joe Biden, his policy is very much in line with the Democratic electorate. So they're doing good work. Do, you have any, do they have uh, anything in there about Richie Torres? <laughs> I, I didn't see anything about Richie Torres. But I mean, That's, uh, yeah, they're... Um this is a whole other thing, but like Data for Progress apparently worked pretty hard in helping him secure the nomination. And, uh, you know, his his thing is that he's sort of like an off brand like AOC, but his with the added benefit of being a fervent, insane Zionist, uh, which, you know, I can't think of anything that could help the South Bronx more than uh, keeping Israeli possession of the Golan Heights. I can't think of a more pertinent issue for that part of the country. Well, it's funny. I, I saw I saw uh, Andrew Yang's campaign tweeted this week that um, Andrew Yang will will lives in New York City and will never leave the city unless it's on official business to New Jersey, Washington D.C., or Israel. Yeah, no. I mean, if you need to go, you need to go somewhere and learn how to make the shittiest version of shawarma. <laughs> if you want to make it wet in all the wrong places, <laughs> that's where you have to go if you're mayor. Data for progress finds Heshi Tischler a okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> I um I don't know. I'll be ranking Heshi number one, two, three, four, and five in my ballot. <laughs> I don't know about you guys. Uh, so this year, it doesn't hurt that Mr. McElwee has a talent for self promotion. Does anyone put out push poll? Put, does anyone push out polls to push media narratives more effectively than Sean McElwee? Quipped my colleague Shane Goldmacher last summer after a Data for Progress survey that showed Jamal Bowen. Jabal Bowman, a client of the group leading his primary race, prompted an influx of liberal donations and energy into his campaign to defeat a longtime congressman in New York. For his part, Mr. McElwee, 28, once described himself as Radiohead for donors. You can't really explain why I'm good, but everyone knows that I'm good at it. Nobody does it better. Data for Progress is funded by a mix of private donations, paid polling work, and support from foundations that back its research on issues like climate change. I would love to know what some of those foundations are and why they back their research on climate change. I'm, uh, I'm like um, Burzum for donors. <laughs> <laughs> I call them all Jewish, whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> Of course, for many political activists, strategists, and officials, leveraging approval ratings to push an agenda is a pretty basic political strategy. But in a world of young progressive activists who often argue that a central goal is to bring left-wing ideas from the fringes into the mainstream, the data for progress approach can be controversial, criticized in some quarters as shrinking expectations and selling out a bolder vision of racial justice and economic equality to appeal to wealthier and more moderate voters. I mean, you just that, that just describes the Democratic Party. I don't, yeah. I don't think this is, can fairly be blamed on data for progress. I mean, they're fitting in to a Democratic Party machine and apparatus that does. I mean, like that is their the reason they well, exist is to sell out. Well, well exactly. Yeah, like data for progress. It, it, the it, they're not selling anything. They're not selling uh like progressivism, whatever the fuck that means to to Democratic office holders. They're selling the Democratic Party to voters to say, hey, no, these guys. They they do care about the things you care about. I promise. Look at the polling we did. Yeah, this is um you know the actual social purpose of this group. You know, we could get into the uh, institutional point of it. Like I think we're we're all pretty aware of that. But the social point of this is uh, it's for like a certain type of sort of like Atlantic subscriber who, uh, in the same way that boomers got obsessed with World War II, they're now obsessed with the Civil War. They think they're all Sherman. Uh, because they voted for Liz Warren. For that type of person, this uh, this gets rid of the contradiction and the anxiety they have over just voting Democrat with, with no problem in every election, even though they're sort of out of sync with a lot of their stated views. This allows them to look at voting for you know Brad Schneider or whoever the fuck and go, oh well, you know he he's done this thing that isn't great, or he said this thing that isn't great, and he said it as soon as you know as recently as yesterday. But if you look at the polling, he's going in the direction of what I want. And I can keep sort of uh, cosplaying as a radical Republican from the 1860s or 70s. And also, uh, let's not forget the purpose of all kinds of groups like this. All these, all these associated gr uh, organizations that sort of hang barnacle-like off of the Democratic Party, which is as uh, uh, jobs programs for the most annoying children of investment bankers. Uh, you mentioned Richie Torres earlier. I mean, it should be noted that Data for Progress supported Richie Torres over the more progressive uh, pr uh, opponent. Yeah, and they pr they produced a poll showing that pers that candidate as as in low single digits and, and as a as a long shot, uh, not worth supporting. Uh, and then when the actual vote happened, it turns out that they had underestimated uh, th their support by a huge percentage, which I'm sure was totally uh, Matt, not intentional. Matt, in any I way. mean, Matt. We've all worked with data before. Data is a is a, it's a fickle thing. Okay, it is a harsh mistress. Yeah, it's just you can't get you can't get them all right. Okay, sometimes you're gonna or any of them. <laughs> and the beauty part is you don't have to because it doesn't relate to any actual uh, outcome or uh, or process. There is no data that you're uh, pointing to. Like you have the data is is just a a bunch of numbers that you can make say anything. Well, it's there's also there's never any point where it has to relate to any actual outcome or any actual opinion of people because you're being paid for your PR uh, abilities, your ability to sell a pre-existing uh, agenda, and that doesn't require data. And that just requires absolute fucking shamelessness. Yeah. 
And I mean, like, and it's also the it's, 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 it's this sort of boutique polling firm where like they can they can, you know, push an agenda based on a popular opinion poll. I mean, it's also the like, questions that you hire them to ask in the first place, because like no one's hiring data for progress to ask Democratic voters. Would you rather we spend four billion dollars a year on arms sale as just selling, like, just giving weapons to Israel or should we spend that four billion dollars on, I don't know, uh, anything else here in this country? You could pretty much uh, solve the entire homeless problem in easily New York, probably probably like four other states with that money. Pretty easily. You know, people like to say, oh, three billion, four billion, it's not that much on the federal scale. Well, it's more than nothing. And I also like that this this article um uh, made sure to include that they led a successful campaign to nominate and confirm Deb Haaland as the uh, first Native American cabinet secretary without mentioning all of the other people that they endorsed for cabinet positions that got no love whatsoever. And then they like retroactively said that they, they did endorse and support the people after they were nominated. You guys remember that? I like that. I, yeah. I do like that. I do like that. I considered becoming a donor after that. I mean, lying is awesome. It's it's great. Let's be honest. Yeah, it's pretty fun. Um, we have a, we have a, we have a, uh, a an opposing view here. Uh, it says, quote, "quote Imagine Sean McElwee giving a keynote address at the Walmart Center for Racial Equity forever." Wrote Matt Carp, a history professor at Princeton <laughs> and contributor to the Liberal Magazine Jacobin, warning of a left that gives away too much of agenda to a corporate Democratic Party. And I, th- I think one of the first five Chapo guests. Ah, uh, yes, he was a very, very, very early, a very early Chapo guest. He uh, will be held accountable. Yeah. Uh, Mr. McElwee and his organization, which now employs nearly two dozen data scientists, policy experts and communication aides, say spending their political capital now that Democrats control Washington is kind of the point. The point of being a progressive and being involved in politics is to make progress happen, said Noise Cat, an activist and author who was Data for Progress's first employee. At a certain point, progress should mean we got X and Y things done that made people's lives better. I think it's kind of ironic that a lot of progressives forget that the main point is what we're supposed to do, the progress thing. Over the past three... I, I can't wait. Yeah, so, okay, sorry, let's yeah. do it. Let's go. Let's get some progress. I largely agree with that. Progress? I largely agree. I'm ready that, for progress. That the point of politics is to, you know, enact policies that improve the material conditions of the people who are your constituents or just uh, Americans uh, overall. Um, would, would love to see that happen. Let's go. Over the past three years, Mr. McElwee made his own shift from self-described, self-described Overton window mover to a more pragmatic approach, uh, coming to embrace Mr. Biden. I don't like him very much, he said in 2019, before meeting with his campaign less than a year later. And moving away from calls to, quote, hashtag abolish ICE, a slogan he helped popularize that became a rallying call for the left in 2018. Only about a quarter of voters backed the idea of eliminating immigration and customs enforcement, according to polling at the time. Well, I mean, look, they just didn't have the data. They didn't have enough data before they launched that hashtag. But now with all the communications aids they have, there's, they're, never, there's, they're never at a loss for data. I also like to, he said, uh, I self-described Obert, Overton window mover. Like I'm imagining it's like the, the guy's moving a huge window pane across the street in like a Three Stooges sketch or something like that. Like, oh, the Overton window, hope it doesn't break again. Yeah, that yeah. was when he would just post Abolish Ice over and over and over again. And then he would just go, I'm moving the Overton window like Ralph fucking Wiggum. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Kristen Gillibrand was the wealthy dowager who ended up getting a pie in the face. <laughs> so uh, now his group advocates what Mr. McElwee has called a normie progressive theory of change, backing liberal candidates who can build broad coalitions around popular policies. Think lawmakers like Representative Lauren Underwood, who flipped her suburban Illinois district, rather than more firebrand progressive leaders like Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. On policy... They've come to embrace what they believe are the most popular parts of a liberal agenda as a way of persuading voters who might be skeptical of bolder rhetoric, emphasizing a clean electric standard instead of a carbon tax, for example, or focusing on passing Mr. Biden's agenda through reconciliation rather than fighting over abolishing the filibuster, a proposal that currently lacks sufficient support among Senate Democrats. Oh, wait. Oh, so it lacks support among Senate Democrats. I thought this was about Democratic voters. I thought these are popular policies that appeal to the electorate, but in fact, it seems here that the, what's popular or not is still largely determined by the people holding office in the Senate. Yeah. The thing is, though, the, the thing is, though, that um, progress is sort of it's the lifeblood of data, but without progress, you can't move forward. But if you move forward without getting things done, well, that's because you forgot the data. I mean, I mean, like all this stuff about like. Uh, you know, like uh, 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 it says, uh, 
sorry, what was the quote? They said, uh, back in candidates, you can build broad coalitions around popular policies. I mean, like, I think that is a winning strategy. I mean, it's like basically the only strategy that counts. But like the popular policies, like, they, like this article, No Data for Progress, is really mentioning which of these popular policies that they're really championing here. And if it's the popular like, ones. Well, it's like if it's a bipartisan infrastructure bill, I mean, I, like, I guess that's popular, but like as compared to, like I said, Medicare for all or, I don't know, decriminalizing all drugs or just flatly legalizing marijuana is popular, is, is like one of the easiest to accomplish and most popular political pieces of legislation. Not even legislation. It's just one of the most popular policies that you can enact as president. And I don't I, like for some reason, though, I mean, like Joe Biden certainly must have data on this. He's uh, he's not moving forward with either of these these popular policies that would enact broad change and improve the material conditions of uh, everyday life for millions and millions of Americans. I, I just don't see what the deal is. Can we get some better data on this? Well, yeah, the, the the entire thing here is I mean, we've talked about this previously, how there is this sort of fever pitch thing about uh, the end of democracy, all these uh, highly restrictive like uh racist uh voting laws they're coming into effect in swing states and you know any anywhere with a republican governor or legislature uh and you know it's it's like it is a serious thing and it is awful but at the same time it's just being sort of used as a way to fuel media consumption and Again, that thing where you you know you you have some job with computers and you're like, uh, yeah, no, I'm like uh, I'm like John Brown. Uh, at the same time, though, this isn't reflected in the Democratic control of uh, Congress and the presidency. There's no real sense of urgency. Uh, yeah, there will be a speech by Merrick Garland or Joe Biden that talks about this, but. There isn't this sense that, oh, this we only have like a few months left to do this. We should get this all done now. And this, um, you know, all this data, all this data for progress is uh, you can go back to what you thought before this, before Trump, where you're like, oh, we'll take some time, but we'll get there. But then you can also use the end of democracy thing to browbeat anyone who – you know, it, it is like, this sucks. I can't believe I, you know, I got fooled into, you know, whatever poor, poor dummy got fooled into going to Georgia or whatever to get these guys elected. I'm not going to do that again. You can use that to browbeat the, those people. At the same time, during this next, like, year that they have this, uh, you're, you're going to be able to point to the data and show that this is all moving at a steady pace eventually. It doesn't matter that those two ideas are completely in conflict with each other. Uh, you just get to do that. I just think it's weird that, I mean, like, maybe it's, maybe it's the fault of the person who wrote this article. But in this article, there are no specific examples of any of the popular policies that they're championing or any example of, like, a shift in policy that has been enabled by their wonderful polling and data. Because it, it seems to me like the Democrats are just doing what they would do regardless. Look, these guys have lanyards now. They have an office. They get to go to meetings. They get to circle back. They get to do all the cool office things. They don't just post anymore. That's the real accomplishment of Data for Progress is it got these losers' jobs. Yeah, this is sort of like um, the Constable Bob storyline in Justified, <laughs> but he doesn't go anywhere. Or never doesn't get to be a, a hero. <laughs> yeah, just his day-to-day -day life before he met Raylan Givens. Well, actually, no, I, I, I spoke too soon because there, there is two small paragraphs to go before the end of this article. It says here, Data for Progress is also trying to move, move more into electoral politics, hoping to expand its list of campaign clients beyond Senator Elizabeth Warren's re-election race and the Senate campaign of John Fetterman, Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor and one of the state's most prominent Democrats. We're relatively young, but my belief about progressive politics is that first and foremost, we have a moral obligation to win, Mr. McElvey said. The demands in a lot of corners for policymakers to hold positions that are highly unpopular is wrong. And, you know, like I said, I, 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 I it's just like I would like some sort of I mean, I because like on his face, like he, like he's right. Like, you know, like it, you, if it, you do have a moral obligation to win. But if that person winning is Richie Torres, I think it's like pretty much just throw it in the fucking trash. You have no moral obligation whatsoever. But also when he said like they, they keep talking about like these unpopular policies are, are an anchor around the necks of Democrats. And we just need data to show us what the popular policies are. Pick the most progressive of them and run campaigns on that. I would just like some delineation of what they're talking about here. 
Because it's just if it's simply a matter of choosing the popular policies and shedding the unpopular one, unpopular ones, it should be pretty easy to state which policies are good and on the docket and which policies you're, you're willing to uh, throw over the lifeboat, throw out of the lifeboat, rather. But um, like I said, I, I'll, I'll be waiting to hear. Uh, I'll just be, be waiting on Data for Progress's new polls about Medicare for all or a single payer. Yeah, just like any kind of national health care system. And like also isn't like the it's just sort of a broader point about like, oh, like uh, the data shows the Democratic voters want to pass things through reconciliation rather than the filibuster. But then they're only referring to Democratic senators and not the people who vote for them. And like, isn't it like also like a sort of a point of all this like micro targeting polling shit, just an excuse not to do things that are like it, it, it's like sort of a wash whether they're popular or not. But like voters, I don't think really re- like make a choice to vote or not vote for someone based on like, you know, the, these these sort of policy concerns overwhelmingly. Like, I think it's more just like, can you get shit done? Does it appear that you are strong or weak? And it just seems yeah. to me like that this is just like, oh, well, we can't possibly do filibuster reform because it's like 49 percent unpopular versus 51 percent. Un- you know, it's like a 49 for 51 split. And we don't want to end up on the wrong side of that issue. But like what you're sacrificing yeah, nobody, for nobody's doing is actually going to care. Nobody right. actually is going to vote on that. I mean, I mean, th- this this should have all gone out the window when Biden won won the larger slice of people who supported Medicare for all. Shouldn't none of this matter after that? Yeah, no one actually knows or understands any of these issues. They're, they're all just sort of responding to the words, sort of vaguely, oh, something they heard on TV. That, that's not determining actions in any way. Yeah, and, and if you do hold this model, like you, know, like you said, the 51% versus 49%, I mean, okay, if you just accept that, there's no like, role in the president or role in any other elected official or anyone to move public opinion, like, what, where, where are you going to end up? What happens when, like, some weird generation that has no concept of the future and doesn't have any kids is the main voting block and all the, like, it's like you pull them and it's like, oh, uh, like, all their issues are, like, r slash child free issues. <laughs> like, though you shouldn't allow children. No crotch spawn at yeah. fucking theme parks. Yeah, they can't see Cars 6 when I'm in the theater. <laughs> and that's, like, the Democratic platform because it gets, like, 57% versus, like, 32% or some shit. And I'm not saying like you know, it's it's just it's just like automated politics. Yeah, this yeah. Is like this has a lot of like activist branding, but this is essentially this is the same thing as living your life, uh, taking Ubers and getting Grubhub everywhere, where you just press the button and you don't think about it. It's the same fucking thing. And like you know, the use of abolish ice is an example of something that is like you know popular on Twitter and in activist circles, but like only about a quarter of the country actually approves of that sentiment. Well, you know what? Like a quarter of the country is like not any small slice of the country, and like. There are policies that are enacted by the Republicans and indeed run winning presidential campaigns on that are supported by about only 30 to 25 percent of the country. And it's not really a problem for them because like if Biden, let's say Biden had got in there and had abolished ICE and like polling had shown it was unpopular, but like he just stuck by it and ran on it and never apologized for it. Like, I don't think it would really make that big of a deal to like whether he were reelected or not. I think it's just a matter of like what voters perceive you as and whether they perceive that you are like cringing away like you're gun shy like at every moment from like the things that you ran for office on and and then also go back on or fail to accomplish like any of the things that you promised and like just appear weak i don't think it really matters what your policies are how good they are how in line they are with the supposed beliefs of the electorate because like the electorate doesn't really know what they want not not really I think they just you know want like Joe, a strong, competent leadership, or the or the impression of strong, competent leadership. You know when Joe Biden won, Joe Biden he won when that like Stephen Crowder wannabe guy asked him like, how, "Oh, how many genders are there?" And he was like, "I don't know, man, at least three. It just didn't give a shit. That's when he won. You know when he almost lost. You know why it was like kind of close because of hey, he 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 looked like a bitch in that first debate. That's it. That's it. That's all that fucking matters. That's all that matters to the last presidential election. No one knows, like, like if you went to Joe's, who, first of all, who goes to Joe's website to look at the policies? No Please, one who voted for him day. in the I love it. Yeah, yeah, no one who voted for him in the primary. They like it when he gets up there and, like, calls the guy fat and, like, stumbles around and tells a perfectly remembered story from 70 years ago and then is convinced he's in 1981 and is talking to Casper Weinberger. They like that. They... 
well, like I mean, the image of Joe. Felix, you're right. Like he won the he won the majority share of voters who said that they were for Medicare for all after being the only candidate who explicitly said he was against it. And then most of the things he did say he ran on, they've either gone back on or, or like like actually like cut 180 degrees against the thing that they said that they were going to deliver if you voted for them. And guess what? His approval rating is like in the fucking in the in the 60s overall. And among fucking and then, registered Democratic voters, I would imagine even higher than that. Look, it's not going to do him any favors in the long term if he needs to like, you know, I don't know, win a midterm election or anything. But like, that's not a concern to them. They don't care about that. No, they don't give a shit. No one in the, no one like quoted in this article gives a shit. And no. Yeah. I mean, well, well, Joe is sort of the perfection of that Obama model where it's like, really who cares and in fact we'd prefer to lose congress but we'll have a popular executive forever well joe is like more built to be that eternally popular executive way more than obama yeah you just bring him out there in front of a green screen once every two weeks have him tell some weird fucking story have him have the saint patrick's day bonanza every year <laughs> that's perfect for him this is a job he was born to do. Uh, by the way, uh, Joe Biden is overseas right now for all like the G7 summits, and he's meeting with uh, the Queen of England, uh, Erdogan, and uh, a meeting, <laughs> meeting with Putin coming up this week. Did you see when he, he met the Queen of England, and he was like, she, she reminds me of my she mom. She reminds me man. of my mom. And it's like, she's five years older than you. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> like, yeah. that, but again, like that's why he won. That's yeah. why he won. None of this shit matters. It, it's like, that's why he won. If you think Joe Biden won the White House or the Democratic primary or continues to be a, by modern accounts, an overwhelmingly popular president because of any policy he has enacted or supported, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, compare that, okay, compare Joe to any Democratic candidate like since Clinton. Compare him to John Kerry or Al Gore. Like, what, could you imagine Kerry or Gore saying that to the Queen? No. Could you imagine them like, like being like, man, it used to be, ten years ago it was gay bathhouse, <laughs> everyone <laughs> was taking poppers, <laughs> like that's it, that's it, that's the Joe Biden story, and he nearly blew it because they didn't give him enough Adderall at the first debate. That's it, that's I, it, that's your fucking story. I, I just think like I, the story of Joe. I mean, I brought up Joe Biden being overseas and in England especially because. <laughs> It, it is like a it, it is a weird feature that is different about Biden than other U.S. presidents is that he is driving the Ulster the Unionists insane, like they're, they're <laughs> yeah, like they're they're that. burning him in effigy in parts of Belfast and like I, I saw guys walking around with signs picketing him in England that said Joe Biden is an enemy of Ulster and I thought that <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Because, like, That's, you know, I mean, like, it's like his one foreign policy instinct that is correct is he has always been a Republican. And he, he flicks it up with Jerry Adams and he, he quoted the Yates poem about the birth of the Irish Republic and shit. And he's he's God, man, he like he's 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 not afraid to stick his thumb directly in the eye of these fucking <laughs> these, these loyal, and, these unionist Irish people. And the best part, he's probably only like. 15 percent oh Irish. yeah absolutely. he's like 89 percent german like that's any why american you go, that's why you go hard that way so yeah. you can yeah. assert your your irishness in the face he's, of evidence he's showing he he's showing out big I, yeah i hated that shit when like trump one where people are like oh this isn't who you are this is exactly who we are and we're it's like what like a queenie asexual outer <laughs> borough billion no like very few people in america are actually like that you know what america is like a more like passively racist, like uh, mostly German guy who pretends he's Irish and yes. sundowned is sundowning, but still like works at his job and in fact got a promotion. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. That's we're Joe. Indeed. I mean, it's just like I, it's the last thing I'll say about like it, it, I just I just saw a thing the other day about how, how how Democrats have identified yet another micro demographic that they've regarded as that they regard as key to the 2020 midterms, and it's essentially. Slightly more downwardly mobile suburban moms who like uh, went Obama to Trump or then didn't vote. And they're like, we're activating to like to target this key demographic. And it's like, I don't even know what that means. But it's just like, like all like all of this shit, all the this, this, this polling about policy or whatever. Like, it's just it's an excuse for them to do the things that they're already going to do or not do. It's pretty much baked in. And then if they were like behave like a real political party, like the Republicans do, they would just simply have an agenda, run on it, and work, and then work to enact it when in office. Damned how popular or not popular it is. They would just get it done, and in getting it done, the pop the policies would probably become popular. 
or if they they won't, it won't affect your reelection chances, even if they're brutally unpopular. Because look at how much, look at how much of the, like the law and like government in this country is popular. But yet, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. mean, I, like, I mean, the fact that we have fifty percent voter turnout is astonishing to me. At all, Should that's be- what's so that's what's so weird about this entire project is like they're pointing at all these things that have been laws for like thirty years and being like, oh, actually, no one likes it. <laughs> it's like. Okay, so why are you here? What, what the fuck are you accomplishing? Nobody does it quite the way you do. Why'd you have to be so good? All right, well, I'd like to move on to the, uh, the second... Uh, reading a series for today. This one's a little shift in pace. This one is back to the back to reporting about the labor market and the fact that people they just don't want to work and and their laziness is being passed on to the customer in the form of increased burrito prices. That's right. No, <laughs> I'm reading from this comes courtesy of the Federalist and one of their Wunderkid uh, uh, staff. Um, this is by Kylie Zempel writing in the Federalist. <laughs> Awesome. Kylie Zempel. Uh, we were the German Americans. Yeah. They really knocked it out of the park with the names. Kylie Zempel writing in the Federalist. My Chipotle bowl just got more expensive, and it's the federal government's fault. Life is breezier on unemployment than behind the Chipotle counter, so the franchise is trying to lure workers back, but it's making my lunch more spendy and exposing lies about who really eats the cost of rising wages. It's making my lunch more spendy. That's like when I saw this, I thought that Kylie Zimple was like she is like a sleeper cell because this is like this is perfect. Like this is like, you know, this was gaining some traction in uh, more conservative circles, people who are still unabashedly, you know, openly uh, economically conservative. Uh, And, you know, I'd say that most people uh, they don't they don't see things this way but among the more conservative sectors this was picking up some speed but this is so this is so good this is so this is that viewpoint so nakedly because it's like oh what 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 they should work like you do yeah writing a journal about your lunch (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i love that it's just like life's breezier on unemployment than behind a uh fucking chipotle counter it's like well yeah that's true but life is certainly breezier fucking at some like make work job at the federalist where you fart out stories like this for you know like i mean insulated from any market competition whatsoever i mean like that's the easiest gig you can get yeah i mean you're you're not like kylie zempel you're never gonna work at fucking chipotle what do you what the fuck are you complaining about you get you get paid to do this does it really matter if your burrito costs an extra dollar a month i'm pretty sure it's easier to write articles for the federalists than it is to fill out forms for unemployment yeah i mean like like, dude uh, dude the forms you fill out for unemployment are scrutinized a hell of a lot more closely than anything that's published in the Federalist. You, you can write anything in the Federalist, like literally, you anything. If you know the right guy, you can say any pitch. You can, you know, like, um, uh, oh, like um, my lawn jockey's got my got my kid kicked out of uh, the school band. <laughs> you know, fight for me. All right, here we go. Chicken bowl, brown rice, black and pinto beans. Pico, hot salsa, lettuce, cheese, sour cream. That's all I want. I, I, I love that for that that <laughs> just that first sentence because that's that's all I want. And what I want is every single ingredient at Chipotle in a bowl. Cut to and, <laughs> and cut to cut to American military in every base. Endless bombings, <laughs> just people in cages. This is how I get it. <laughs> Like, this is the entire conservative project. Black and Chipotle beans? Lady, are you crazy? And you're saying you don't want to pay extra for that? Yeah, think of what you're... Think, a lot think, of beans. She's stealing from Chipotle every day when she just, just asked for... eating yeah. beans. God damn it. <laughs> so he goes here, and I want it for seven sixty plus tax. You fucking greedy pig. Seven sixty plus <laughs> oh tax God. for every ingredient in Chipotle stuffed into a bowl. Also, why do you want it for that price? Just because that was the price that they put it at? What if they put it at something else? You'll pay for it no matter what. Yeah, you're 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 just going to do it. You're not going to make your own lunch. You don't know how to do that. So it goes here. Thanks to the ill-named American Rescue Plan and remarkably short-sighted employment decisions, the federal government has jacked up the price of my Chipotle order. Sure, the restaurant is the one raising its prices by about 4%, but the federal government is the cause. 
<laughs> four, so four percent. Four percent. Four percent. What does that work out, out of? Out of seven hundred cents, that's like that's under forty cents. Well, also there's that's no nothing proof. There's no proof that that's why they're doing it. That that's just something that the fucking Chamber of Commerce says as a propaganda operation to try to make people turn against unemployment benefits. There, there's no the, the, the fucking. Uh, there's been a big surge in in commodities prices too that probably had something to do with it. There's a ton of other things that could go into fucking price costs uh, at, at a place like that yeah, with, with a massive industrial s- uh, size uh, uh, purchaser like them. It, just taking for their fucking word for it that that's why it's up. It's 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 literally just a, just furthering the propaganda operation commodity prices rose way more than that you know yeah in the in the past 30 years far far outpacing the cpi but you know no articles about that and i i saw the idea that's like i want it for 760 plus tax oh like you won't fucking pay for it at eight dollars and ten cents plus tax give me a fucking break shut up and it's like it's still a good deal you're still getting every ingredient in the Chipotle buffet shoved into a bowl that's then stuffed into your fucking face for under $10, okay? All right? Sure. Uh, across the restaurant industry, chains such as Chipotle, Starbucks, and McDonald's have been increasing hourly pay for employees of company-owned locations in a bid to attract new workers and retain their current ones, NBC News reported. Consumer demand has come roaring back for restaurant meals, but the workforce has been slower to return, pushing eateries to sweeten the deal. Did you catch that? Restaurants have had to bribe current and prospective workers with fatter paychecks to lure them off their backsides and back to work. Uh, that's just called the free market, Miss Zemple. Uh, that the bribing them—that's called wages. And if you Bribe, can't, bribing uh, them with the uh, with the surplus uh, value that they created—that's pretty fucked up of them. Yeah, yeah, it's like okay, well, you have a workforce out there that's um, not willing to do the job for the uh, wage that you're paying. Then, oh, I guess you'll just have to bribe. I just love the idea that that's illegal or something. That this is like they're acting in a corrupt way by asking for more money, and guess what? Because it's because it's making their treaty treats more expensive. That's the thing about these fucking people is that there's been this half-assed attempt to try to create some like worker-centric conservatism, but at the end of the day, everyone sees themselves first and foremost as a fucking customer, as a consumer, and so whenever there becomes a conflict between their uh, consumer interests and what they imagine to be the interests of anyone who is giving, who is providing them with. The, the service or the good that they seek, they're going to say, yeah, no, you should be uh, you should be forced to work like corvée labor. You should be chained to the fucking uh, the fixins bar so that I can get food on my term. It's sort of yeah, similar to how. Yeah, you can't you can't make like a hair invoke workers party when 75 percent of your voting base like calls the police when their grub hubs like five minutes late. <laughs> yeah. When it's all John Bedoritz. Uh, I mean, it's also like it's so sort of similar to the way that like libertarians have been um, arguing against the Civil Rights Act for the last like five or six decades because they're like, well, I mean, it eliminates the right of free association and private businesses should be able to uh, refuse service to anyone based on any criteria or consideration. You're like, "Mm, okay, well, uh, what's happening now is that a lot of employers and, uh, you know, uh, places of business are saying that you can't work there or shop there unless you've got a vaccine. And wouldn't you know it? Who's the most opposed to that? It's these same group of shithead libertarians. So it's just like it, it, they, 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 they see no problem with the idea that um, allowing private, <laughs> private businesses to refuse service to people based on their like, race, gender, or religion isn't a problem because they, would, they never would think for even half a second that they would be on the receiving end of that. But then when it comes to vaccines, it's time to squeal about your liberty. Going on, she says... That's what happens when the federal government steps in with a sweet unemployment deal, incentivizing workers to do a little less labor and a little more lounging. Under the CARES Act, the original coronavirus spending bill, the federal government handed out an extra $600 per week with no eligibility requirements, meaning even millionaires could collect it to unemployed people. According to a report from the Heritage Foundation, oh, well, you know, in that case, from the Heritage Foundation, I'm going to take this very seriously. The average full-time American worker earning $48,000 a year could take home 15% more from unemployment under the CARES Act than remaining in his full-time job. This sounds a little absurd. And it is in almost every sense. It's important to remember, however, that however spendy and unsustainable these subsidies were, they were the product of a different time when onerous government restrictions slammed business doors and kept many people out of the workplace. But then things changed. 
businesses started to reopen, and the unemployment rate dropped from 14.8% at its peak in April 2020 to 6.7% by the end of the calendar year, meaning many Americans were getting back to work by last Christmas. Okay, so then what are you complaining about? What are you complaining about? What's the problem? The, the, the burrito might be more expensive. I love that she just keeps saying spendy as a word. It's very annoying. Yeah, she went to the University of Pinterest to learn how to write. <laughs> Nonetheless, the short-sighted federal government decided to keep doling out unemployment checks months later. As part of their exorbitant $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan spending bill, Washington politicos kept writing $300 checks, which would have remained $600 if Democrats got their way, on the taxpayer's dime and on top of state unemployment benefits to Americans who weren't working. Added to the average state unemployment check of $330 per week, the $300 federal subsidy that Americans could sit at home for $630 a week, or more than $32,000 per year, about double the national minimum wage. That's a pretty sweet deal. It's no surprise that burger joints in my beloved burrito heaven have struggled to get workers back on the payroll. My beloved, bur- burrito, my beloved bur- burrito heaven. It's Chipotle. It is the worst trash imaginable. Oh it's my okay. god! It's, it's like, fine. No, no, it's, it's like it's, it's like the most like job. mid mid it's food. Mid. It's fine. It's yeah, it's fine. exactly like, as as Felix said. It's burrito purgatory. Yeah, yeah. it's. It, I mean, look, it, it's it's. I mean, it's better than some fast food options, but like, I can't imagine just being like like a Chipotle is my neighborhood favorite. If Chipotle is your favorite food, you are just like, yeah, you don't have an internal monologue. Most mustelids have like higher degrees of self perception than you do. If that's like your favorite food, it's fine. There's nothing like wrong. With I mean, it, sometimes it's, it's like, like a, as a food of last resort when you just want to get like a brick of fucking like food in your gut to just like you know just sort of like as ballast so that you can continue on your your labors and functions of a day. You could do worse than Chipotle, but like I, I just like eating there every day, calling it my my own personal heaven. Uh, just if you eat the yeah, if you eat there every day, like one of your grandparents was a Labrador. <laughs> I mean, the thing like, well, come well, on, because this was precipitated by a, a, a Chamber of Commerce announcement about this for, for the exact purpose of putting this out there. She might never have even gone to fucking Chipotle. This whole thing might just be in the voice of, well, what do, what do American Cretans like? Well, they really like Chipotle. So I'm going to slather on my Chipotle love in this thing so that they feel like I'm on their side in the consumer war to keep cheaper burritos. That's true. Like this, she could very well be going to, uh, what's the, what's that evil steak restaurant in DC? Signatures. Le, uh, Diplomat. Yeah. No, like, signatures or French gone. laundry or whatever the fuck. She could be good. Maybe she goes to an evil restaurant every day. Uh, probably. But, um, yeah, she no, probably, I think she probably goes to the fucking, uh, the, Twenty dollars salt salad place, like everybody else in DC. Yeah, yeah. Uh. She writes. Conservatives warned about this. Of course, people with one ounce of forethought knew exactly where massive unemployment perks would lead. You can't pay people handsomely to stay home and then expect them to jump back into the Chipotle uniforms. But this whole Chipotle price would I, you ever do yeah, that job? You would, would never you ever fucking you would, do that she job. Would never would consent. anyone you know? Yeah, you would never do that. You would never fucking do that. She goes. But this whole pro Chipotle price hike reveals another thing about conservatives. Have, another thing conservatives have long been right about: when companies have to raise their wages, they don't absorb those costs; they pass them off on you. In an effort to bring an additional twenty thousand workers, Chipotle announced in May that it would raise the hourly average wage to fifteen dollars by the end of the month, the same dollar figure Democrats have pushed as a federal minimum wage. Give people a living wage, they demand, for entry-level jobs that were never intended to support full families. Oh, well, they were never intended to, but I got news for you about what they are now. I mean, yeah, what, where, what are you talking about? Where are the other live? jobs? Where are the other jobs for people that are supposed to support full families? Can they just get a job in a fucking factory? Well, I mean, they should get, a, they should get a job for it? a think tank or a magazine like The yeah. Federalist that is funded entirely out of pocket by some fucking vampire that is that, exactly that has no, as absolutely like uh, 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 Kelly Zim- Kylie Zimple's writing has never once been subject to any market force ever. For clicks, are, yeah. for views, for ad dollars, for fucking for uh, against better writers, she's never had any competition. It's just if you, if you're if you're a conservative college student, you're fed into these fucking programs, and they give you a make work job at some place like the Federalist. If you if you have no shame and you come from a family background where this kind of thinking is, uh, I don't know, encouraged, then like you got it made. You got it made. Yeah, this is. Um Usually, when we read like goofy conservative like Federalist things, it's like fun and like. It's hard to get too mad at a lot of them because a lot of them are so patently ridiculous, right? 
like you know a lot of them are like oh you know i i i called the police because you know a, a child on my block like dressed up like little zan for halloween like i saw temporary tattoos and i had a panic attack i like i i some insane personal problem or like rod dreyer where it gets like a little dark like the exorcism story but it's still so like they're so alien to me that it's like kind of funny but this is just like this is so fucking repulsive because yeah that's exactly it like writing is such an easy job already if you can i'm sorry like if, if you dedicate yourself to it and you can't do it like you probably just suck i'm sorry yeah and then to even take what little like market force there is out of writing and to be this person and like demand people just shuffle into these soul crushing positions. Like there's anything like there's any other fucking job for people that like uh, don't have a college degree or even do just have a four year degree and no personal. Or who just don't like, have the conservative so social network repulsive. to just give you a fucking job like this at the Federalist. Like do you think, do you think Kylie Zemper has ever been paid in her writing career anything close to what a market would actually like demand that she earn for the articles like no. give me cheaper burritos? Yeah, no. Who if Kylie Zemper left the federal list, who would follow her? What list of subscribers would come? Or is she just she's sort of like the literary equivalent of someone shoveling slop at Chipotle? Yeah, yeah. but getting paid a hell of a lot more and probably with way them, more so, I don't know. having a way easier life, never having to worry about the things they worry about. So she goes here, uh, they demand, uh, give people a living wage, they demand, for entry-level jobs that were never intended to support full families. All the while, they shush conservatives who protest that a $15 minimum wage at McDonald's, for instance, would raise prices, harming many of the same low-income Americans who dine there. That's exactly what's been happening at McDonald's. Not if their wages are higher, too. Yes, exactly. They can fucking afford it. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> well, the thing here that I enjoy, though, is that, and this whole genre that has emerged uh, in the last few months, uh, these articles freaking out about unemployment, is that it does reveal uh, the, the coercion, the, the repressive uh, force at the heart of capitalism that is obscured by the fact that, that the thing that is making people go to work is just the threat of poverty, the threat of hunger, the threat of losing your uh, home or your health insurance. Because that's not you know, uh, that's not being carried out by the state explicitly in the form of, you know, an army of, 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 of uh, overseers or something. It becomes invisible. Uh, but when people are, are like, get back to work, fucking peons, uh, or it, it's wrong for you to not fear uh, starvation uh, more uh, than working a demeaning, very, very low wage job. They're showing, oh, yeah, this thing actually is as coercive as any of the horrible systems that they claim to be opposing. Well, it's just that the coercion is is invisibilized. Well, yeah, and here they're just putting it right out in the open. Is that, is that it seems like it's all free. Like in the free market, yeah. it's just like these are just contracts being entered to by free individuals. And if, hey, if you don't want the demeaning job, you don't have to do it. Well, in order for it to be a free, like a free decision or an actual negotiation, there would have to be an option of surviving without work. It would have yes. to be like a generous social welfare system. And on top of that, a UBI that would basically be like a permanent federal unemployment insurance that could make it so that, yeah, you could get by with not just not working a job. And that way, if you choose to work a job, well, then, well, then that choice actually means something. It's a choice that you're actively making rather than being, you know, disciplined through the, mar through the fear of poverty or starvation into doing. Just cl finishing out here, it says... Um, that's exactly what's been happening at McDonald's, where the traditional dollar menu has become a relic of the past and prices have soared as wages have gone up. I mean, like, I, I understand, like, the restaurant businesses, like, in the restaurant business right now, like, prices are going up because, like, they, they're having to pay a lot more for things like meat and fish or whatever. But for a company like McDonald's, like, I, I, don't, know, I don't know if the dollar menu is still there or not, but, like, are, are their prices rising dramatically I went to, I, I went to, I got uh, there now, I believe, I was just there the other day, uh, the BTS meal, uh, it is $5 per nugget. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, that's the BTS if you, meal. If you, if you can't buy the same amount of food for $1 that you could literally 20 years ago, yeah, call the police. Just get, get like, repurpose ice to force people into these positions until there is literally no inflation in the price of food. It exists in everything else. It exists in housing. It exists in cars. It exists in everything else that you don't give a shit about. 
But, like, if you can't get the same amount of food, this is a grand societal problem. If there's any inflation in food prices over a 20-year period, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, she, she finishes out here saying, when the federal government pays restaurant workers to stay home, home is where many of them will stay. And when Chipotle needs to compensate for it by dangling a 15-hour minimum wa- a 15-hour ma- wage in front of the low-skill teens who work there. Okay, I'm sorry. It is not low-skill teens who are working at McDonald's and Chipotle anymore. I mean, some of them are. But a lot of these are just people with families. I never. And, I, and, I, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That, I'm sorry. The wage that they're paying wasn't intended to support a family when we started the service economy well, that in this mean country. Anything. That's but it doesn't gibberish. mean That's anything. It never meant anything. What, what the fuck? It, uh, the, what, what, there was there ever a time when restaurants weren't open during school days? <laughs> yeah. Was there ever a time yeah. when you go to McDonald's at three in the afternoon on a weekday and it was closed? That was never true. So therefore, those jobs were always for adults. Just, what you, adult? Jo- what adult job should the people working in Chipotle get, according to her? Well, I mean, like, I, I think, I think, like, I think if you, I think if you put that to her, she would just say, well, they need, they, they should have invested their time earlier in life and skills so that they could get a job writing for the Federalist. They should have gone to college. If ever, or yeah. But that is her, like, oh, they should have gone to college. Well, if everyone goes to college, that doesn't increase the amount of jobs, you fucking dingbat. If she worked at Chipotle, she would toss her fucking, she would drown herself in the cilantro vat within the first hour. <laughs> so, you, so you get here, uh, by dangling a $15 an hour wage in front of the low-skill teens who work there. I just love that phrase, low-skill teens. Like, what a fucking... What a, what a fucking what a rude thing to say to people who fucking make you're a low food. skill adult yeah. and you'll never be anything <laughs> yeah. but that. You have no skills. If I left you in the woods, you would be like fucking f- fucking vultures would be circling you within a minute. <laughs> within a fucking minute, you have nothing. You're nobody. I could launch you into space, and then an identical fucking blonde woman with like uneven dimples would replace you. Wait, I feel like no how did one you guess fucking this woman cares. Was how did you guess she was blonde? <laughs> Federalist writer. Yeah. <laughs> Kylie Zimple. <laughs> I got to say, uh, I, I don't think I'd want to meet a high-skilled teen. That, yeah. They sound terrifying to me. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> so I, have here. A, so I have a certain set of, set of skills. I always know who imposter is. Goated. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here, uh, so Dude, put that in the promo. He says, the franchise will stuff that extra cost right into your burrito. Yeah, by raising prices 4%. Give me a fucking break. So the final, the final sentence here, she says, Chipotle broke my heart a little today, but big government is breaking my budget. You don't have a fucking monthly budget. What are you talking about? Oh, or a and, heart. Or, or, like, or the idea that like a 4% increase in the cost of your burrito bowl will break your fucking budget when you work a job at the Federalist. Give me a fucking break. It just says here Kylie <laughs> Zempel is an assistant editor at The Federalist. Follow her on Twitter. It doesn't list any other jobs that she does. No, no. It says, okay, her oh Twitter account God. says... What a fucking psycho. Her Twitter account says editor, Federalist. Previously, DC Examiner and Nat Geo Travel. Not the Bachelor Beat reporter. Wisconsin native. Oh, I'm very sorry. <laughs> what, a, what an amazing CV. Yeah, God she got the, she got the Joe about- McCarthy Fellowship at the Heritage Foundation as like a 16-year-old. <laughs> fucking, and she's been riding it ever fucking since. Fucking low, low, no-skill adult getting paid way more money than her fucking labor is worth on any free market. Get the fuck out of here. Eat your burrito bowl. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, and you're, you're, by the way, if she really does eat this, if like our conspiracy theory that she goes to an evil restaurant isn't true, she's going to keep doing it. Yeah, no, she's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna be like all those fucking round balls of shit who are like, oh, I'm boycotting the NFL because of Kaepernick. Well, what are you gonna do? Talk to your family? No, you're gonna <laughs> fucking watch that game, Fatso. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that does it for the Federalists, but we have. The first two articles we did today were mere hors d'oeuvres before this amazing entree, this feast that I think is maybe one of the best reading series I've ever come across. I am, of course, talking about the article I found in Slate the other day about a woman who adopted a dog and killed it. So, I mean, you, you think... Uh, you think that might be an exaggeration, but no, that is exactly Whoa. the article that we're talking about. And I should, I, I sort of <laughs> preface this article that like, okay, I, I know when we do Dear Prudy or any of like the advice columns to Slate, we always sort of have to preface it by saying, assume that they're all fake letters, that like these aren't real people. This is not a letter to Slate. This is an actual article with a woman putting her name to it of a personal essay. 
So I mean, I, this I, is that, yeah. that gives me like I, I, it makes me way less likely. This is not anonymous. This is not like you know, <laughs> bedraggled beagle and butte. <laughs> you know, like this is this the, is the a, hacker anonymous <laughs> wrote this article. We are legion. We kill dogs. <laughs> this is this is a woman writing under her own name in a personal essay in Slate. Again, it must be stressed how she adopted a dog and then killed it. Um, you may think I'm exaggerating, but we're gonna, we're going to get into the article. And I would like to also preface this article by saying. That when it was published, uh, if you if you look at the replies to the author herself on Twitter, the lineup of like blue check media journalists telling her how brave she was for writing this is fairly astonishing. They're, they're also just, saying like, "Hey, it happens to all of us. Yeah, we all had, yeah. to, we've all <laughs> yeah. had to put our dog in a microwave. We have all fantasized about it." <laughs> this is right. like, yeah, that's my favorite thing that happens is when someone writes like a fucking insane article. Like, do you remember that Atlantic article that was like? I inherited my my mom's slave. <laughs> yeah, you know? and people are like, "This happened to me too. This is so complicated. <laughs> like we all go through it. <laughs> it's <like> solidarity. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? What the fuck? You're insane." Well, Felix, listen, listen, listen to the listen to the headline here. This is uh, the headline is when Bonnie came home. Subhead: Just before Christmas, I adopted a six year old beagle. She was adorable and violent. I found a resolution. I found a resolution. Many choose, but few acknowledge. <laughs> so this is, this is, yeah, everyone's doing it, but no one wants to talk about it. We've and also, all done it. Also, keep in mind for this article, and she says that the dog was violent. And look, it's a sad fact, but there are a lot of like fucked up violent dogs out there that probably shouldn't be home. They're like, it's just, it's hard to know what to do with them. But like, they shouldn't be given to people and certainly not families. It, it, it's look, it's a difficult decision, but like. When she describes the violence that this dog is capable of, keep in mind that she is just talking about a beagle and not a pit bull or like a mastiff or something. It's a beagle. It weighs about, I don't know, 10 pounds. How much does a beagle weigh? Like 15 pounds probably? No, they're a little bigger than that. A little that. bigger probably than like that? 25, 30. Yeah. Okay, so like... It, I mean, beagles can be assholes. You know, they are, they are kind of head case dogs. So I don't they're wanna, grumpy. I don't want to undersell it, but here, I just like... When she makes a decision to do what she does, I think the fact that it's a beagle she's talking about is a little bit, makes it just adds another layer here. So like, look, without further ado, last Christmas morning, I patted my bed, inviting my newly adopted beagle, Bonnie, to jump up and cuddle. My boyfriend, still under the covers, reached out to pet her soft little head, which was now wedged between us. I turned away to grab my phone and it happened. A guttural bark followed by a human scream. I whipped around to see my boyfriend's hand covered in blood. Before I could figure out how to help him, he was out the door on his way to urgent care. It was Bonnie's second bite in the week since I adopted her. <laughs> okay, okay. We can, we can already tell her boyfriend is not a man of Thulean might. No, no, no. It, he went to urgent care over a beagle bite. I think I found your first problem, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> this guy will never find the Thulean mysteries. He's a beagle, he's a beagle boy. Uh, like many others last year, I was thrilled to adopt the dog. God damn it. I just like I I really hope that this phenomenon is not as widespread as she talks about. But I fear she may be on to something here, especially among the type of people who write and read articles for Slate.com. I was thrilled to adopt a dog during pandemic. The so-called pandemic puppy boom made for what felt like stiff competition at the time. According to one Nielsen survey, pet adoptions between March and July 2020 rose more than 15 percent from the same stretch in 2019. After a month of filling out applications, I was eventually contacted by an animal shelter in New Jersey. A six-year-old beagle whose photo melted my heart was ready to meet me. Some friends and I drove down from New York City to pick her up, and when we got out of the car, Bonnie trotted up to me immediately. Timid but curious, she allowed me to scratch one of her velvety ears as she sniffed my jacket. When she leaned into my hands like the beagle I had grown up used to, it seemed to meant to be. <laughs> and then I drew a bead with my laser guided sight <laughs> on the crossbow I was holding. <laughs> it says, Took out my claymore. <laughs> a few weeks later, I was sitting on the floor of my kitchen with Bonnie and a new dog trainer. We were working on positive reinforcement training and desensitizing her to triggers like the vacuum, which she'd bitten the night before. Vacuums, along with almost everything else in my apartment and outside of it, terrified Bonnie. I was already familiar with these training messages from a master class I'd seen in which a celebrity <laughs> dog trainer assures new pet owners he can help their dogs overcome things like accidents in the house, excessive barking, and digging in the yard. 
At the beginning of each video lesson, an intro sequence plays. There are no untrainable dogs, he asserts, only untrainable people. I just like well, kind like, of kind of right here. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, like, I just like it's just sort of the glimpse into like, you know, it, I, should I adopt a dog or not? Well, I watched several TED talks about it and I noticed that everyone else was doing it. So I thought, hey, a lot of stiff competition out there. Let me check the data. Yeah. And I do like I do want to say I do like in some abstract sense, I feel bad for it because it's like the shelter was like apparently they were like, oh, this is like a chill dog. He's like most beagles and that he's been bred to not be able to stand up for more than a combined 10 minutes a day. And then it just like, you know, he's, he's clearly traumatized. Sometimes you get a lemon. Yeah. Sometimes you get a mean dog, but, um, the choice to write about this is insane. Okay, that, that the okay, choice to tell yeah. people about it is this, the, the, like, as the article goes on, like this will get more pronounced, but like this to me is like, look, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I wouldn't, <laughs> kill an otherwise healthy animal just because it was <laughs> annoying me but you know sometimes it's either you or them you know a bad pet yeah. can really fuck up your life and sometimes you know if you gotta do what you gotta do uh just just don't tell anyone about it yeah. like it's insane what enough why are you telling me validated <laughs> oh my yeah like sometimes there's shitty things that you have to do and then part of the uh the shittiness is that you have to live with it on its own terms you don't get to to have a therapeutic uh uh compensated public confession where you know like clockwork every blue check psychopath on earth is going to tell you how brave you are and how you did the right thing yeah no yeah. it's, it's like I, you can't just and i do I, I do think like it really was like this woman and her boyfriend or the dog like i do think this was a life and death situation for them <laughs> knowing that the boyfriend instantly went to urgent care after one bite is like, okay, yeah, that dog would have eventually probably killed them if she's you know, telling the, the full unvarnished truth here. But, like, again, you couldn't you just write an article that's like, you know, I have um, I have uh, separation and anxiety from WandaVision not being on TV anymore. Can't you just write that article? You have to write the dog killing article. <laughs> well, no, I mean, that's exactly uh, right. It's like you can't just live choice. with... You can't just live with the choice and like feeling bad about it, even though you're like, hey, I had to do what I had to do. You have to share it with everyone in the expectation that they're going to tell you how brave you are and how good your decision was for fucking. <laughs> All right. Let's just go, go further. Well, into that, it. That's how that's how our that's how our, our uh, creative media class uh, is is dealing with living at this wheezing, dying empire as well. We have no real uh, practical imagine way to fix any of this stuff and frankly our material conditions would not benefit by any radical change but we can publicly feel bad about it and well, that there you go consecrates our our, our uh, position because you know would you want somebody who didn't feel bad about it enjoying this uh, signature i bet you wouldn't same time though better writer than uh, Kelly Zemple for sure. Kelly Zemple. Kelly, Kelly Zemple yeah. used the word "however" about three times in the course of one clause, yeah. and then and then made the used the made up word "spendy" to talking about how a burrito is going to break her budget. So yeah, this woman, yeah, in in like in like the market of ideas in the market of writing, this woman is like she's bringing a lot more value. Well, I mean, I think that the difference between a Slate dot com writer and a Federalist writer is that the Slate dot com writers have learned how to because it's their stock and trade. Uh, do a simu simulation of empathy mm -hmm. and like and demonstrate it, whereas Federalist writers have no such compunction whatsoever. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Like works to their advantage. It's like the less empathy you're capable of showing, the the yeah, like the, the the more useful you are to them because then you can write things about how low skilled teens don't deserve a living wage. Yeah, like this woman. Okay, so this slate writer, this is like her insane perversion is that she has to tell people about this, like. That she did it, it's like in some ways I can kind of understand it. I still don't like. I just to be clear, really I, don't right endorse, to I, don't I don't endorse. I don't endorse her decision. It. I, I no. don't like. I I don't think you should go about it that way. I think it deserves some more time. But it's like in some scenarios, I get it. Maybe her perversion is clearly like writing about it. The Federalist writer, her perversion is doing this. She's probably like adopted forty dogs just to kill them. <laughs> I was imagining someone just go, pulling up to the dog shelter every week. He's like, need something new. Give me the usual. They're like, <laughs> Can you give me, get me something that lasts this time? <laughs> so she continues here. 
Bonnie had sunken her teeth into my hand during my first full day with her. I'd reached out while she was licking my leg, unaware I'd crossed the boundary. Well, I mean, okay, I mean, did no one ever tell you that you have to, like, stick your hand out, like, under a dog's nose before, like, you do anything? It just seems to me like nobody's really clued her in to, like, certain certain things. Like, you can't just, like, do it uh, when you meet a dog for the first time, just, like, reach out and grab it. They tend to get a little uh, skittish about these sort of things. So you have to like sort of, you have to you have to show a, sort of like a, a submission. Hold hold your hand out. Let them smell you. Let them get you know know your name and in a dog sense because when they smell you. So I mean, I'm, I, it, it's true. Like I, I think the dog is probably a basket case too. But you know, dogs are very intuitive. They pick up a lot from the people that they're around. So she goes here. When I explained this to the trainer, she reasoned Bonnie needed time and space to adjust to her new home. Still, I couldn't shake feeling guilty as if I'd done something wrong. When friends and colleagues asked me, I just couldn't shake the guilty feeling as if I'd done something wrong. When friends and colleagues asked me about my new dog, I only half lied. I said she was doing great. And when I tilted my webcam toward her during Zoom calls, I made sure my swollen, scabbing hand wasn't visible on the screen. <laughs> After all, it was true that she had happily lounged next to me all day while I typed words into my laptop. And that when I sat cross-legged on the floor, she'd come and curl up in my lap, her tail thumping against my legs. As I posted videos of Bonnie gently snoring on Instagram, I didn't mention she was wiped out from a day of gnawing on her own paws so much that they bled. I can okay, <laughs> okay. How much? How much would this woman play with the dog? Because, like, dogs, even beagles, need enrichment, or they go fucking crazy. Especially beagles. If you're treating a, if you're treating a. A cat can kind of, you got to give a cat some toys and you can play with it sometimes, but the cat mostly makes their own enrichment. I mean, honestly, Cats, like I, I think these people like need to just be told, if you're thinking of adopting a pet, adopt a cat and not a dog. Yeah. This one was treating her dog like a cat because there was nothing in here that's like, oh, I was playing fetch. I like got this new toy for, if it's gnawing on its paws, it's telling you like, I need to do something. I'm going fucking crazy here. She stuck this dog in like a one bedroom morgue slot with her and her hemophiliac boyfriend. <laughs> and is like, oh, what the fuck? He's in my dog. She's anxious and fucked up. And if the dog is, well, yeah, of course she is. If the dog is bored and anxious, you can like, they, they like smoking weed too. I mean, that's what helps with my boredom and anxiety. So she never even tried the, yeah. the bong hit method. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dogs love it when you blow weed smoke in their ears. That's how they get high. <laughs> Don't do that. Dude, I do not <laughs> no, endorse this doing that. This is a warning. Do not joke. do that. It's a joke. Yeah. So it says, it's not uh, true. Uh, um, I convinced myself that she just needed more training, that I could help her if I only worked hard enough. The daily dog anxiety meds came next, though they did, they did little to make my otherwise healthy pup less afraid. And despite practicing those desensitiz desensitization tactics every day, Bonnie regressed lunging at perceived threats on the street like joggers, other dogs, and squealing kids. One night Because you have her in solitary. <laughs> like, it's like, this is so, okay, I started out like, okay, I understand, and now it's like, okay, so we instantly went to therapy and medication for this fucking dog. Not like, oh, they, they, she needs like a more complex toy or like games yeah, or and attention. They, you, like, you try tiring her out by taking her to the fucking park a couple times a day. But no, no, I got to, I got to, no, I just need something to sit next to me while I type into my laptop and just sort of like look adoringly at me. I mean, that, that's what this woman wants. Yeah, yeah. So that's what you have a boyfriend for. <laughs> <laughs> She goes, well, the boy, the boyfriend is like, he's not long for this earth. No, he's going to like a hummingbird's going to fly into him <laughs> and he's going to die from blood loss. <laughs> like uh, yeah. One night before bed, while she was squatting to pee beside a tree, she bolted at a man strolling up to us on the sidewalk. Before I could react, she chomped into his calf, his pant leg in her teeth as she tried to pull it away. Why wasn't she on a fucking leash? How did this happen? How did she just bolt she, for a man she, walking down the street and chomp into his calf muscle? What? Don't you if if the beagle got out of a leash, it's like these are like are you are her and her boyfriend like skeletons? <laughs> like, how are they so routinely overpowered by this beagle? To my surprise, the man brushed off the incident. I did not. From that night on, each time I bent over to pet Bonnie or sat down for a belly rub, I monitored her every move. Any sudden shift and I'd pull away, flinching. Yeah, hard to imagine why this dog has anxiety. Uh, the trainer came back a few days later. Bonnie bit her too. With each incident, there was no growling, no toothy snarling, no indicators that she would pounce. There are no untrainable dogs, I thought, only untrainable people. I became adept at fastening her muzzle on in a matter of seconds, which I now had to do any time we stepped beyond my door. 
Each time we came back inside, I tried to feel relief when nothing bad happened. I never did. Months of failing to exhale helped me decide I should find Bonnie a new place to live. Maybe city life didn't agree with her, I reasoned, and a quiet existence in the suburbs is what she needed. Oh, yes, that is what Bonnie needs, a quiet existence on a nice farm upstate. <laughs> yeah. So it goes here. Um, uh, I couldn't, uh, I says, uh, I knew that my safety and the safety of my neighbors, I couldn't continue to manage her behavior. I never was able to anticipate what would set her off, and there was no way to control her environment on the streets of New York. But I soon learned that the shelter where Bonnie came from wouldn't help me. A volunteer explained that Bonnie was too dangerous to adopt out again, and their affiliated sanctuaries, including several Beagle-specific rescues, declined to take her. Another dog rescue organization in New York City told me that her bite history, seven bites at the time, though that number would grow, was too extensive for her to qualify for a special, be a special rehabilitation program. Both conversations ended on the same topic, behavioral euthanasia. I was. I love a story. I love a story where there are no heroes. <laughs> yeah, there are no heroes in this story. <laughs> I was dumbfounded to discover you could call a vet's office and ask them to do that. Suddenly, <laughs> my new quest to help Bonnie get better, I'd become the decider of her fate. Well, you know what? You know what? Uh, you know what? Uh, the thing is, when you chose to adopt her in the first place, you did in fact become decider of her fate. And that's in, that's, in fact, when you adopt an animal, that's what you're committing to when you take them into your home from any of the agency that rescued them. You are indeed becoming the sole arbiter of their fate. So maybe consider that before you adopt a, a, a pet. Or, or just adopt a cat, which basically you don't have to take care of. That's what you of. wanted. Yeah. That's what she wanted. She should have gotten a fucking cat. You get two cats, like, again, they do their own enrichment. They have some bizarre thing where they like looking at each other and then like I mean kissing. yeah I mean what they're looking at is the souls of dead people that inhabit still inhabit this planet yeah. or they're yeah. or they're doing the universal cat consciousness swap program where they're like oh my shift in <laughs> my, <laughs> my shift in Istanbul my shift in Wellington begins uh, in an hour I gotta get over there yeah. <laughs> I gotta go to sleep this is did we say did we talk about this on a yeah, show we did, we, did. we did yeah. we talked about the cat theory so it goes here Almost nobody willingly adopts a biting dog. And concealing a history of aggressive behavior is likely how I ended up with mine. So, like, yeah, it is true. It does seem like the rescue agency did behave unethically in giving her this dog yeah. in the first place. But um, she says, I'd put a post up on a private rehoming site for her anyway, making sure to disclose her history and special needs. I explained she preferred women over men couldn't be around children, and needed to be muzzled on walks and around visitors. Perhaps a single female hermit in a rural area would be opening to managing her behavior for the next decade or so. I held out hope for a while, but never received any adoption inquiries. And as her bite count continued to grow, so did my desire to stop living with a dangerous animal. I could feel my heart beating out of my chest every time we got ready to go outside, fearing for the worst for our walk. I only left my apartment without her once per week so I could buy groceries. This way, she wouldn't get nervous about being alone. She'd lash out when I returned. I tiptoed around my two-room home each day, hoping I wouldn't cross any invisible boundaries. I just love the idea of this woman just, like, living in absolute fear in her apartment of her beagle. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like, this is a... Yeah. This is like it's like I know it's like it's and this is like a brave this is what, this article, is what, but this is really funny. This is what Kathy Griffin felt like when Yashar was in her house for <laughs> fucking nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so it goes here. Uh, even if I did somehow find someone to take it, Bonnie. I wondered whether it would just exacerbate her already crippling anxieties. As the week went by and no new options appeared, I realized I had a choice. I could send her off with a stranger one day someone she would certainly injure and who would perhaps end up euthanizing her anyway, or I could allow her to leave this terrifying world peacefully with someone she loves. I just, <laughs> that is such a good way to rationalize it. It's just the world is just too difficult for Bonnie and for me. So I'm just going to give her she's, the choice to leave it with someone who truly loves her. She's like Kevin in Sin City. <laughs> Uh, so it goes here, behavioral euthanasia is not a decision made out of convenience. Hmm. No, guess, guess not. Uh, typically, it enters a conversation once the safety situation with a dog, cat, or other animal deteriorates beyond an acceptable level of risk, said Christopher Patchell, a veterinary behaviorist with instinct dog behavior and training. There isn't a universal approach to every situation. Often, if the police aren't involved, it's up to the pet owner to decide what level of risk they can live with. If you're the one who finds yourself in a situation where you're actively considering it, choosing to rehome is hard. 
Choosing to push forward with a treatment when you know it's unsafe is hard. Choosing to make significant accommodations to make it safe, even though it's not easy, that's hard. Choosing to euthanize is hard, Patchell told me. There's no easy way out of that difficult situation. But what we're ultimately having to do is say, which of these hards makes the most sense for me? I desperately wish someone could come and assess my personal level of risk. <laughs> Oh I wait. I've, I've got okay, a, that's I wait. the new. That is. Yeah, I've got a great got a idea. I've got a great idea do. for a new business. Is yeah, this is this is a new job. Uh, this is a new boutique service for anxious urbanites. Someone who can do- come and say, uh, I, "I hereby give you permission to kill your dog." Yep. <laughs> no, I will be. I will do the canine risk assessment. And actually, Branson, uh, he was writing about this article. He said, like, there should be like a a boutique assassination service where they just take care of it for you anonymously. It's just they, one shot from 400 meters away. The dog is down. It's over. <laughs> you can just say someone assassinated my dog. I don't know what happened. <laughs> and you know, like if you're a dog assassin, most dog assassins don't work for the FBI. I'm like human assassins. So you could like go on the dark web, just go on Craigslist, just take out a contract on Bonnie. It's no problem. You don't have to write an article about it. So it goes here, uh, I desperately wish someone could come and assess my personal level of risk, something only I could do. It was an excruciatingly lonely decision to make, but when I turned things over in my head, I came up with this. In a comfortable and loving home, Bonnie was always on the defense, even in the calmest of situations. When it came down to it, her quality of life was poor. I couldn't envision her feeling safe in any situation, no matter how rural the home, no matter how, how many triggers are eliminated. To prevent her from harming herself or anyone else again, I chose behavioral euthanasia. I love the idea that the dog is going to self-harm. No, this is only you and your boyfriend's hands that you're worried about here. It's not that the, the dog is at no risk of hurting herself. On the phone, I wept quietly as I made Bonnie's appointment, taking shallow breaths as the receptionist instructed me to make sure she was wearing her muzzle when we arrived. Bonnie's last day came sooner than expected. On a quiet Sunday morning, while I pet her on the floor, she inexplicably snapped at my face. Though her mouth clamped down hard around my boyfriend's forearm instead of my cheek, when he jumped up, she held on, piercing deep wounds in his arm and a hole in his sweatshirt. She scampered away from us afterward, head down, trembling. I was so stricken with fear that I didn't realize I was also trembling, forgetting to breathe. It was then that I knew for certain I could not continue living with Bonnie any longer. I tossed, her, I tossed her one of her favorite bones to calm her down. I called to reschedule her appointment to that afternoon, ordered an Uber, and put her muzzle on for the last time. Then I hugged her for a while, still too shaken to cry. In the Uber, Bonnie, who preferred to sit in my lap during car rides, looked out the window, sweetly unaware. When we arrived, Bonnie started trembling again. We were shown to a small waiting area, and a staffer at the animal care shelter approached me, approached us to tell me she understood how hard this was and that she supported my decision. I would have expressed more gratitude if I'd been able to do more than mumble. I'd been warned I wouldn't be allowed in the room with Bonnie during the procedure because of COVID protocols. But instead of saying goodbye in the car like they'd asked, I'd explained that Bonnie was petrified of the vet, and I insisted I walk her to the exam room so her last moments wouldn't involve resisting a stranger. In a few minutes, I was led down a hallway. I coaxed Bonnie to follow. Her, a staffer showed me to the room Bonnie needed to enter. I gave Bonnie one last pat, then handed her Kelly Green leash to a tall man in scrubs and a mask. As he shut the door behind me, I heard Bonnie whine, a protest to being separated from me. I'm shattered when I think back to that moment, but at the time, everything was blank. In the days after Bonnie was put down, I roamed my newly empty home like a zombie. I didn't sleep much, and when I did, I was startled to awake by nightmares of being bitten. Crushed with guilt, I wondered if there was more I could have done to help my sweet beagle. I didn't tell most people what happened. What if they thought I was a monster for not trying hard enough? Well, you solved that problem. Good thing you don't have to worry about that anymore. Instead, I made a post on Instagram so I wouldn't have to talk to the people who had been gushing over Bonnie. Rather than detail her situation, I explained she had an illness that went un- undiagnosed before I adopted mm. her and that I had to say goodbye. She was sick just in a way that was impossible for most people to see. I used that to help myself co- cope. So, folk, I mean, like, this is it. When you adopt a dog for Instagram, people are going to ask questions when they stop appearing on your stories. <laughs> <laughs> so come up with a good backstory. Hence the dog assassination agency. I, uh, yeah, I like to compare this to the Russians who we follow on Instagram who are like, yeah, this, these two raccoons just started showing up in my bedroom and it's been three years and we've learned to get along. <laughs> Like, all the people who have sables, these sharp little bear tubes who fly all over the place and, like, learn how to deal with it. 
And then this woman, <laughs> Deagle. Not long afterward, my browser tab, still comprising dog behavior Reddit threads and news stories about Major Biden's biting incidents. By the way, um, how is Major these days? He's doing good? <laughs> He, he oh, doesn't man. have any undiagnosed illnesses that need to be explained after the fact. Do you think They're Joe do you think, him in Area 51? Do you think <laughs> Joe was like tried to give her as a, give Major as a gift to the Queen? <laughs> Here, man, it's like it's a perfect, it's a perfectly good dog, man. <laughs> he loves being outside. You got plenty of land. <laughs> he just he just kills her instantly. <laughs> Just, just goes, just chomps down on the throat and starts just, just shredding, just ri- whipping, just whipping the head back and forth. <laughs> yeah, he picks her up by the neck and just snaps it. Yeah, blood everywhere. <laughs> ah, no ah, one could have seen this coming, man. Yeah, I mean, he, he was a great, he's, great he's, a, he's a great dog. He's a great dog. <laughs> a great, it reminded me of great mom. It reminded me of my mom, which is also killed by a pack of dogs. <laughs> He goes, uh, I came across Losing Lulu. It's a Facebook support group for pet owners who have had to make the difficult choice to opt for behavioral euthanasia. If love was enough, you'd still be here, reads the group's cover (laughs) cover photo in bubble letters. I have a new group I'm joining. Oh, Oh, man. I later learned that Losing Lulu was founded in 2019 by dog trainers Trish McMillan and Sue Alexander. Yeah, dog dog trainers? More like dog killers. (laughs) (laughs) Since then, it's amassed more than 10,000 members and sees around a dozen new posts per day. Folks, 10,000 people have done this in the last year. It's it's the hottest new trend. It's called killing your dog. (laughs) Sometimes love isn't enough. <laughs> There's a fucking support group for this. Next thing you're, oh, you're gonna have TikToks with with uh, m- women in huge suburban kitchens just putting a guillotine on their <laughs> kitchen island. <laughs> you know what? This all really goes back to the first thing because, like, this is the Democratic base. Is like members Absolutely. of. Absolutely. Absolutely. Saying goodbye to Lulu. (laughs) And you know what? Like, I mean, maybe this is, look, maybe I'm reading too much into this. Maybe I'm pushing this a little too far. But if we think of it along that lines and all of the, like, you know, like, like just loud congratulations that this woman got and how necessary and brave this was for her to admit, do you not see, like, that perhaps that this is, I don't know, a rehearsal for how these people think other sort of intractable, shall we say, problems in our society can be solved. Oh no, no, yeah. This is this is gonna be the solution to the homeless issue. Yeah. It'll be like because it keeps getting pushed farther and farther. It went from like we should have government housing to like they should be allowed to eat trash and sleep outside. That's like the humanitarian position. And now it's gonna be like ten years from now it will be like Republicans are like we should make we should draft bigger homeless people to form a homeless chariot that chases other homeless people and beheads them. And liberals will it's be just like, like, we we should just give them a shot. Yeah. We just kill them instantly. <laughs> yeah. It's more humane. It's just sort of like, yeah, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the world is too tough for them. We yeah. Just, we need to give them a humane the, exit. A, a I do loving, think that, like, a loving way out. I, I'm wondering if, like, ritually killing your dog is what you do when you don't have the net worth to get invited to the islands and (laughs) subterranean adrenochrome parties of the ultra-wealthy. Yeah, it's like a striver thing. Like, one of these days, this is going to be an infant. But for now, it's just going to have to settle for a chihuahua. I'm just imagining... Yeah, my my, my family could tell I was ambitious when I was a little kid because I wanted a Pomeranian to kill. (laughs) I'm just loving the idea of, like, a Facebook group for, like, People have had to, you know, find a solution to the problem of the lovable neighborhood tramp. It's called like losing whistle stop Willie. <laughs> yeah. So it goes on here. It says here, uh, name named for Lulu, a foster dog McMillan euthanized. The group was founded by Alexander and McMillan for people who experienced a profound loss that was ultimately of their choosing. When I found the group, I suddenly felt less alone. I think it is really hard to find a corner of the internet where people are not cruel. Well, I'm certainly not this corner of the internet. This is, o- <laughs> yeah, this is only for behind. cruel people. This is only yeah. for the cruel and sadistic. Especially when you're talking oh. about high-stakes events like euthanizing an animal for behavior, said McMillan, a certified dog behavior consultant with a master's degree in animal behavior. Still, members are often cruel to themselves. The self-chastisement people including their posts stuns Alexander. There's a cultural component, she said, that suggests that an animal's behavior is your fault. 
It's one that I'm very familiar with. You go, on, you go on TV and there is a dog trainer who can fix any problem in 23 minutes with commercial breaks, McMillan said. So we have this idea that anything can be fixed. And I thought that too when I started off in shelters and when I started off as a trainer. In my own post in the group, I described how much I loved Bonnie and how I could never anticipate when she'd strike. Like others, I listed out the what-ifs that lingered. What if I'd tried a different trainer? What if I'd moved to the country with her? Dozens of comments poured in expressing that support and sympathy. Uh, curiously, uh, no question was asked, what if I just tried to rehome her for like another couple months? Or like, why did I make this dog live in a two-room apartment? Like, that's just sort of glossed over. This, like... This dog was in solitary. Maybe you can get used to it if you're on the computer all damn day. But, like, the dog? No, you can't have a dog in a fucking tiny two-room apartment. I mean, well, there, there are dogs that are good for city living, like Great Danes or something, that just, like, sleep 16 hours a day, take one giant shit, and then just come back. Like, it depends on the breed. But beagles are a very active, kind of brainy and neurotic uh, uh, breed. They need a lot of uh, attention and a lot of fucking... But even... Even, like, those low-energy dogs, like, two rooms, like, come on, man. I'm sorry. Like, I know that it's, like, I, in my ideal world, everyone would have a bigger place and everyone could, you know, get one if they want. But, like, I'm sorry. If you live there, you shouldn't get a dog. It's not good for them. It's not good for you. I don't know. I mean, it, it all depends. There's a lot of good city dogs. There's a lot of good city dog owners. I think it all just depends on the dog. And, you know, Bonnie, I'm sorry. She had to go. It's not, what, look, she was very nasty. Look, it, look it, it, they called. They called losing Lulu, and they were like, eh, "There was a problem. Nothing could be done, and she's gone now." <laughs> 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 because here, uh, uh, there are dog lovers who maintain that you should never euthanize a healthy dog for any reason. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a few people like that. You could put me in that group <laughs> of extremists. <laughs> yeah. I know because before I adopted Bonnie, I was one of them. It almost makes me tear up a little bit just thinking about the number of clients I've had in that situation who have never have just broken down in my office or on a Zoom call saying, I was the person who said I would never do this, Patchell said. Well, this you know, you never awesome, by <laughs> yeah, the way. Yeah, no, I this love her. This woman's awesome. She's the, she's the best like, person she's, in this article. She's, I said there are no heroes in this. No, this is the hero. The woman who's like a, th a priestess for the dog-killing religion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I love her. I love her. My clients, like people who come to me and are like, I want to kill my dog, but I would feel too bad. And she's like, no, you should do it. <laughs> like, I love her. She, what do you think? Okay, you know how when you like make a political donation or some things, you have to like list your occupation. What do you think she puts? A dog trainer. <laughs> yeah, trainer, yeah. And the, Escort to the afterlife. <laughs> uh, and there's always going to be something else to try. Alexander and McMillan told me there will always be one more trainer, one more behaviorist, one more medication. Alexander often tells her clients, you need to try everything that's reasonable for you, not everything. I thought if I loved Bonnie well, enough... Well, then don't get a fucking dog. <laughs> like, if it's too much, don't fucking get one. By the, way, by the way, you should be able to do this for adopted children as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're fucked up. What do you? What do you want? What do you want from me? I can say that I am adopted, and I currently would. They, <laughs> would your parents have considered doing this? To you? No, I was. I was very good. I was very. Me and my sister okay, and I were good. very good kids. But um, you know, that's good. It's just look. It's just yes. You should try everything reasonable within your power to love the child you adopted. But like, let's not go <laughs> crazy here, okay? Yeah, you have to. You know, you have to give yourself permission to to stand up for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Uh, I thought if I loved Bonnie enough, trained her enough, to help her feel safe enough, she would get better. But like Lu losing Lulu's tagline reads, <laughs> love alone isn't enough to cure an aggressive animal living in fear. I think the Lulus are the most loved pets of all, Alexander said. Our, <laughs> oh, oh my trying God. is hard, but I think to stop trying is much harder. Uh, dude, th this is great. This is a boutique excuse service for people <laughs> who get rid of their fucking this pet. Is this is literally she's starting a new religion where you just kill dog like communion is killing a dog. I love her. I'm obsessed with her. I want you know, a lot of people are like, I want to smoke a blunt with this bitch. No, we do. The dog killing priest priestess is awesome. We love her. Sometime after I, I, hope, said I hope she, I hope she shows up in a flowing robe and just a fucking necklace of chihuahua skulls around her neck. <laughs> I love that the, these are the most loved animals of all. 
I oh actually killing God. your dog is the <laughs> highest honor you could pay it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, she, you know what I love about the dog killing about the dog killing priestess is that like she has like the personality and like values of like a Babylonian warlord. Yeah. But she just had to be born like now and live in like some like bullshit like blue city and have some like yeah, like, li- like <laughs> liberal job and it's like how do I transpose that personality onto this world and this set of values and she found a way. Last two paragraphs here. Sometime after I said goodbye to Bonnie, I took a trip to my parents' house in Massachusetts. After months of pandemic separation, I was reunited with my family and our dog, Lady, a goofy 10-year-old beagle. (laughs) 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 Oh, Lady, if only you knew. It's just like, as, soon, as, soon, as, soon, as soon as she steps into the house, it's like the fucking Terminator vision just zeroes in on Lady. <laughs> <laughs> just out of the way. <laughs> Your beagle, give them to me. <laughs> your, uh, fo- your foster dog is dead. The wolfie's fine. Bonnie's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, when I stopped through the front door, the click, click, click of her nails on the tile floor sent me into a panic. Unaware of my newfound fear, she lazily plopped down by my side. Her face much grayer and body much rounder than Bonnie's. Well, I mean, look. My, my wait, 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 her face is gray and, and she's round? <laughs> wait, wait. Her, her family let Lady get gray and fat? Time, time to go. Sorry, no, this the is no good. doesn't love that this dog enough. This is no enough. good. I need to get them a curved sword from the dog-killing <laughs> church. Just, oh, man. Uh, I stopped over to I stooped over to pet her, and though I'd known Lady since she was a puffly, puppy, marveled at how gentle she was. My heart rate slowed, and something clicked. Lady was a healthy dog. Clearly, Bonnie was not. I couldn't possibly <laughs> picture her acting so carefree. I miss Bonnie dearly, and desperately wish I could have watched her dart around my parents' backyard. But there's solace in knowing she isn't afraid anymore. Yeah, she's not anything no, anymore. Yeah, she's you, nothing now. You took her fear away. <laughs> <laughs> so there we oh, go the, the, the dog killing habits of the upper middle class thank you so much slate.com you never you never fail to come through we should i want to subscribe to them just for everything they've given up. like they've been feeding us content for like years now i love them and we should um we should put a link in the description if you want to join the dog killing religion if you think yeah. it's right for you yeah, you know, they're accepting gonna, new ne- members. Next live show, we will let the dog killing church table. <laughs> <laughs> <the venue. laughs> sorry, sorry, DSA. There's a new way forward. <laughs> but you know what? Like, I mean, what's so stunning to me about this article is like a that she wrote it in the first place, which is like astonishing to me. That b that so many people would congratulate her on how brave she is. But like, look, uh, take, taking the story at face value, like you know. Sometimes the dog's fucked up. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, and if you can't live with it, like, I don't know. Either you just, like, uh, push it out of your car upstate and go, you're free now, <laughs> or you take it to the vet. I mean, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to do. But, like, at no point in this article is she like, and this is why you should, like, not adopt dogs on a whim. At no point yeah. is there, like, a lesson learned here at all. The only lesson she learned is that she loved her to, to your dog too much to allow it to keep living. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the lesson it's not yeah it's not like yeah like really consider before you get in a dog and like and and get one that like you know or a, a responsible rescue agency will give you like a week to like a sort of like a i don't know a trial period or like just make sure that the dog fits your lifestyle like don't adopt a hyperactive dog if you don't lead a hyperactive lifestyle don't adopt like a really energetic dog or a really big dog if you live in the fucking city uh, yeah. i yeah i don't know what to say about that but i think one thing is sure the lady did nothing wrong, and she should feel shouldn't feel guilty at all. Absolutely. Especially not writing the article. That was the least questionable it's thing. Like, about it's all like it's like it's like the BTK killer sending letters to the cops. Yeah. How did she? How did how did I get caught? Well, you wrote you wrote the article on Slate dot com, lady. I don't know what to tell you. All right. I gotta go. I gotta right. go yeah, study we, uh, the, the 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 dog killing Torah for my dog killing bar mitzvah. <laughs> All right, well, we, we went <laughs> finally we, we, become we, a man. We went long today. That's that's three full reading series for you, but none as good as the power of the dog. I like. I had I had high expectations for that, but that was like the Lulu part. The losing Lulu like, Facebook group part of it kicked it up into another another that level of the stratosphere. Really fucking god! Ten thousand members her. and growing every day. <laughs> 
single day new members. I can't wait. I, for, uh, yeah. I can't wait to see the new Indiana Jones movie where Indy's fighting them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was beyond my expectations. I I really like. I went into it and was like, okay, is this as bad as people say? Like, I didn't read it on purpose. And it's like, no, it's like worse. <laughs> it's way worse. All right. That does it for today's episode.